Hello everyone, uh, my name is Max Mineri. I used to work at Toronto General Hospital and now I'm at Leipzig uh, Health Centrum. I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity at, to present at the 19th Annual Toronto Perioperative TE Symposium. And before I start, I'd like to congratulate everyone involved in the organization for doing a phenomenal job in a very difficult time. I'll be talking about tricuspid regurgitation and uh, unfortunately I couldn't connect live because I'm actually COVID positive, uh, fortunately with, with minimal symptom and both my kids at home so it was going to be difficult to keep them quiet during the whole time I was going to be uh, presenting. I don't have any competing interests uh, with the only exception that I'm uh, work at uh, Leipzig Health Centrum that's a reference center for Philips and uh, I'm part of the writing uh, committee for the basic TE exam at the National Board of Echocardiography. I'll be presenting two cases. The first case is a 74 years old female that presented for elective surgery in our operating room with chronic, chronic atrial fibrillation, uh, diabetes, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction 60%, and a, a pulmonary arterial pressure of 48 plus CVP. The preoperative echo showed severe matter regurgitation, and it was the main reason the patient came to the operating room, and moderate tricuspid regurgitation. Now, uh, the surgeon in this case, as in most of the cases at our center, wanted to do minimally invasive approach, and we would normally don't place a uh, superior vena cava cannula or a jugular uh, bypass cannula unless we do a tricuspid valve repair. So for mitral valve alone, we would not place a cannula. We would if we do the tricuspid valve alone. So the patient comes in the induction. And uh, as soon as the patient is intubated, my uh, junior would start doing the echo. And uh, as he does the echo, then he asks the nurse to come and uh, to, to give me a call. And so I come in and I look at the echoes. And as you can see in this four chamber view, um, the uh, both atria seems to be pre-dilated. There is definitely dilated left ventricle. But as we look at the tricuspid valve annulus, it doesn't look so big, or at least not as big as I would expect it, and there's not much of a tricuspid regurgitation. And I start looking around and looking around. I hold the probe now, and in this modified four-chamber, sort of something between four-chamber and RV inflow-outflow view, I could get a regurgitant jet that wasn't even big enough to um, actually measure a vena contracta. And now my junior had already measured the tricuspid annulus and in this first measurement the annulus is 3.2. Uh, actually looking at this picture this is not like sort of an ideal sort of cut to measure the annulus and that's why I decided to remeasure it again and as I remeasure it again then maybe trying to be generous I could find an annulus of 44 um, millimeters. Um, so here we have very little tricuspid regurgitation, and we also have a yeah, dilated annulus, more than four, but not that dilated. So now the question is, yeah, what shall we do? So I'm going to give a, the surgeon a call, and I'm going to let him know, and then uh, we, uh, he said I'm on my way. And in the meantime, this, we used... Um, uh, 3D technology to get some extra pictures and here is the uh, four chamber uh, so for, from the uh, um, modified four chamber view um, I got a 3D block and then with color now we can actually see in the center of the valve on the right that there is a little bit more uh, tricuspid regurgitation with sort of tracing and reconst multiplanar reconstruction we actually found a, a vena contracta area of 0.66 and a vena contracta width of 0.6 here on 3D. When we look at the when we look at the guidelines, 
actually this qualifies for vita contracta width which is not necessarily validated to be measured on 3d but uh, sort of for moderate tracheal regurgitation and actually for vena contracta area uh, with 3d we can only define severe and nothing that's less than severe so if more than 10 centimeters square is severe if it's less than 10 then it's not severe so in this case it's definitely less than 10 is is not severe and we sort of now sort of probably agree that there is a there is tricuspid regurgitation probably moderate and there is a slightly dilated so now in terms of uh, surgical decision making here is where it becomes tricky because like we have preoperative data we have intraoperative data preoperative data are based on transthoracic intraoperative data are based on transesophageal echo and these are just a few information within a much bigger uh, sort of picture which is sort of a patient with comorbidities with sort of a whole clinical history atrial fibrillation dilated atria so <clears throat> what would sort of the um, literature yeah so we know that and this is so now i work in germany so i'm glad to present german data but it's sort of from the uh, from the sort of the equivalent of the sts database uh, from germany we know that uh, tricuspid valve surgery alone yeah regardless is definitely 10 times higher risk of mortality than uh, any other surgery so definitely operating the tricuspid valve alone eventually in the future it's probably not a good option and what we actually know is from this key sort of paper from dreyfus from 2005 is that if you repair the tricuspid valve at the time of mitral valve repair the mortality doesn't change and uh, what does change is that the patients who had mitral and tricuspid valve at the same time they won't develop tricuspid valve regurgitation in the future when those where we didn't repair the tricuspid valve they would then develop tricuspid valve regurgitation in the future and probably the reason for the guidelines from AHA, AHA ACC from 2014 suggest that in case of tricuspid regurgitation if you have a severe tricuspid regurgitation and you do left heart surgery you definitely need to do something to the tricuspid valve when it becomes a little bit tricky is you have mild or moderate tricuspid regurgitation and then you need to decide whether uh, the annulus is dilated or not and the cutoff for dilated annulus is four centimeters measure in a four chamber view and in this case our case for 4.2 and if there is only um, tricuspid uh, um, if there is tricuspid valve uh, di annular dilatation it's a class 1 uh, indication uh, uh, class 2a indication and if there is um, a uh, no tricuspid valve dilatation but there is pulmonary hypertension then it's a class 2b indication in our case we actually probably can classify although sort of on borderline this patient for uh, class 2a so with uh, left heart surgery moderate tricuspid regurgitation and annulus the european guidelines are not very different and uh, again with severe tricuspid regurgitation left heart surgery there is a category one uh, a mild moderate tricuspid regurgitation if the annulus is dilated or there is a, a pulmonary arterial pressure systolic more than 60 then it's a class 2a indication so that's definitely um, um, uh, the case for us so the surgeon said you know what max i'm sorry i i got your point but really in this patient knowing her history and looking at the uh, dilated atria although i know it's not part of the decision making process but still i decided i think you should just put a, a superior vena cava cannula through the internal jugular vein 
and then uh, I'll do a mitral valve. Uh, I try, I'll do the tricuspid valve uh, together with the mitral and this was sort of a four chamber view with X plane of a repair mitral valve that was successful through a small thoracotomy. And at the same time, you can see here, we also place a nice ring on the tricuspid valve and there's no regurgitation. So the sort of key point and take home message from this first case is that uh, as we know, tricuspid valve alone uh, surgery carries a high mortality and, and sometimes we play a significant role in making the decision. And I think based on that and based on the fact that the surgeons are having more and more um, confidence in repairing tricuspid valve, then uh, there is a tendency um, to um, have a lower threshold to repair the tricuspid valve nowadays than there, there was probably a few years ago. And especially because there is no significant increase in uh, um, um, in uh, mortality. Now, the other problem is that we typically assess the patients preoperatively in in uh, in, in determined uh, physiological circumstances, and now the patient is assessed again intraoperatively in a completely different physiological circumstances. So it's difficult to compare the two type, uh, the two time points, and it's uh, and it's uh, uh, as as for other uh, valvular lesions. Uh, ideally, this type of discussions or this type of decision should be made based on the preoperative echo instead of uh, waiting for the intraoperative echo. A different story is when the patient comes and there's no known tricuspid regurgitation and now suddenly we find tricuspid regurgitation. That is probably where our uh, intraoperative finding can definitely make a difference. And when we do do an intraoperative assessment using all the tools uh, that are available to us, actually in our case with 2D images alone, we could barely see any regurgitant jet. And then when we actually use 3D, we could actually see a jet. It was sort of after a few minutes. And I mean, the physiological hemodynamics may have changed, but uh, still uh, use all the tools you have in order to better define your tricuspid regurgitation jet. Uh, now, as a technical uh, discussion, uh, this is functional tricuspid regurgitation. It's due to the distortion of the relationship of not just the annulus or the leaflet, but the whole tricuspid valve complex, which includes the atrium, the annulus, the leaflet, the cordae, the papillary muscle, and the right ventricle. So changing any of these components then can lead to um, tricuspid regurgitation. Now, in case of functional tricuspid regurgitation, the mechanism is the annulus dilation. And because the septal leaflet is attached to the interatrial septum more than the other leaflet to the, to the lateral wall, then there is a tendency for the septal leaflet to not to adjust to an annular dilatation and leave a gap in the center with a uh, um, regurgitant jet that typically it's directed against the interatrial septum. So as a technical um, sort of uh, sketch here to display the uh, different options for tricuspid valve repair, uh, there is the typical, um, there's a few techniques. So one is to put a band and put a ring and just make the annulus smaller. Uh, another option is the so-called De Vega technique, where instead of putting a ring, we just run a suture along the annulus, and then we um, we pull it, and, and that would sort of do it. And then the th third option is this so-called bicuspidization of the valve, where basically one uh, commissure is basically uh, uh, sutured together. So then we basically have like a three cuspid tricuspid valve we can make it a bi valve what's a bit tricky about the tricuspid valve is that um, there is a funny triangle that's called the triangle of Koch and 
it is defined by the so-called tendon of Todaro that goes from the top of the coronary sinus to the um, uh, commissure between septal and anterior uh, leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And that with the um, uh, edge of the uh, septal end of the annulus of the tricuspid valve constitute a triangle and at the apex of this triangle comes the AV node. So, and that's the reason for the annuli that are typically used. This is a so-called physio uh, ring. Um, they are not a full ring, but they're open ring. And this open ring is left open in order to sort of try to stay away from the um, AV node that uh, uh, sits just right there at the apex of this triangle. Here we go, we shift gears and I'm in good time, 15 minutes so far. This is a slightly sicker patient, so 86 years old female, chronic atrial fibrillation. She has a permanent pacemaker for complete block, uh, diabetes, COPD, normal left ventricular ejection fraction, elevated pulmonary artery pressure, and recurrent ascites and admissions with right heart failure. The patient was treated by multiple echo pre-op, and uh, this is the transthoracic echo that shows that mild tricuspid regurgitation, sorry, mild mitral regurgitation and severe tricuspid regurgitation. And that's um, given her picture and the isolated tricuspid problem, then they decided to use a percutaneous technique. We have two types of percutaneous techniques that we use at our center for a tricuspid valve. Uh, one is the triclip and the other one is the Pascal system. Both work in a very similar way. These are clips that basically grasp the leaflet. Uh, both now can grasp the leaflet uh, 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 independently, so one uh, independent from the other. Uh, the, <coughs> the clip is, the leaflet are grasped, then the clip is closed, then we assess for the results. If we're happy, then we can decide to release the clip. If we're not happy, then we can reopen and then we can, we can uh, re-grasp. Yeah, so very similar to what we do for the uh, mitral valve with the uh, difference that uh, uh, here uh, we are going to, we are not going to the atrial septum. This is the, uh, uh, the baseline assessment of this patient uh, as expected for chamber view in the left, on the left side, we have a very dilated right side of the heart. Uh, there's a dilated tricuspid annulus, and on the right side, we can see that there is a, a bright, broad base uh, tricuspid jet. Here is inflow outflow view with X plane, and we can see this broad base jet. And we can, on the right side, uh, from the color X plane, we can see the pacemaker wire there, and we can see that the regurgitant jet comes right next to the pacemaker wire. To the right, is the transgastric short axis view of the tricuspid valve where we can see that there is a large jet that comes from the anterior and septal leaflet and then extends a bit more posterior also be with the, the origin of the jet between the posterior and the septal leaflet and we can clearly appreciate there the um, uh, pacemaker wire that's against the, inter, uh, in, uh, against the septal leaflet of the uh, this is in four in, in 3D. Uh, to the left, we have a 3D, and to the right is 3D with we use the 3D with color again to better quantify the tricuspid regurgitation. And here, it's, there's no doubt this is a severe tricuspid regurgitation with a vena contracta uh, cross sectional area of one meter square. So then, this is the view, this transgastric view is what we typically used for planning our uh, procedure. And here what we planned was to start with uh, one clip between anterior and septal leaflet uh, uh, towards the anterior commissure and a second clip more towards the center of the... And here we have fluoroscopy that 
sort of guide us and we are lucky at the uh, Herbcentrum Centrum Leipzig we have a screen that shows the fluoroscopy that's just above our uh, T uh, machine and here you see that there's the introducer that comes to the right uh, atrium so we need to follow the clip the clip comes out of the introducer here the clip is actually uh, getting close to the interatrial septum we need to tell the cardiologist I mean they usually look at, at the screen as as they do this but although uh, we know that also there's uh, uh, typically this patient come with a very dilated right atrium so there's quite a lot of room for movement for the clip and the delivery catheter but still we need to be very careful because there's a lot of uh, critical structures that can be eventually perforated here the clips come closer now to the uh, superior vena cava and rotate close to the aortic valve and now the clip is now diving going down into uh, the uh, tricuspid valve and this is uh, the clip above the tricuspid valve and now with the x-plane we can uh, tell the cardiologist the correct orientation of the clip to the left we can see in the inflow outflow view we see the clip in its long axis which is not correct and we rotated the clip 90 degrees and now it's in the right orientation it's uh, uh, now in the long, uh, short axis uh, in the um, uh, RV inflow outflow view and then in long axis in the derived sort of here uh, uh, perpendicular uh, uh, kind of uh, reversed or mirror uh, transgastric view uh, now we look at the clip and for the um, and we look at the position and the orientation so for this procedure we keep going constantly back and forth from transgastric short axis and RV inflow outflow view with the explain and we can help ourselves with the fluoroscopy as you can see here to see where your probe is in respect to the clip especially for the transgastric view to align and be with your scanning plane just perfectly parallel or as parallel as possible to the clip and try to remember this picture so then if when you go back into the esophagus and then when you go back into the stomach then you remember where you are where you were and you can maybe that helps you find and sometimes when we are lost our cardiologists they just press the uh, fluoroscopy button and then we can actually get a better picture so as we said, uh, uh, transgastric short axis view, we can see where the clip is and the orientation and the RV inflow outflow view with the derived mirrored four chamber view uh, give us a, a better um, alignment uh, of the clip with the scanning plane and we can see the clip arms and we will use this to uh, monitor the, uh, how we grab the leaflet and we orient ourselves with posterior anterior uh, on the left on the inflow outflow view and medial lateral on the right in the four chamber view so here we come down we position the clip we close the clip we look at the uh, um, leaflet the leaflet are both inside the clip with the clip is closed and here with the transgastric view you can see how the uh, leaflet come right into the clip as i showed in this tiny little dial so we're we're pretty happy um and uh, we look with color there's still a little bit uh, there's still a little bit of regurgitant jet which is expected this was just one of two clips and now we come in with the second clip so you can see the first clip is to the right so closer to the aortic valve and the second clips come behind it and here on the right is the uh, transgastric short axis view and that's where the clip is placed yeah for clip guidance then what do we use uh, uh, we use a, a number of uh, two basically two views one view is the uh, transgastric uh, mid transgastric short axis and the other one is mid esophageal rv uh, inf view with the explain RV inflow outflow view with Jack's plane unfortunately doesn't allow us to always know exactly what leaflet we look at so on the left what we have is posterior but on the right can be septal or anterior uh, our experience is as as you have this inflow outflow view then as you move towards the aortic valve you're cutting more towards the anterior leaflet and 
in the center and moving the probe a little bit, then you cut more towards the septal leaflet. But with certainty, we don't. That is the reason why, for precise positioning of this clip, we rely almost entirely on this transgastric short axis view, where we know for sure what leaflet there are, and we, and we can clearly position the clip. And then we go back to meters of a GL4 3D. Uh, helps a little bit, we don't use it as much, and uh, if we want to use it, then uh, we can correlate uh, uh, our uh, view with the anatomy by uh, trying to include in your 3D block a little bit of the aortic valve, and as you position the aortic valve at about 11 o'clock, the aortic valve helps you identify the commissure between septal and anterior leaflet. And what we often do is we take this block and we just rotate it upside down because that would allow align well with uh, what we normally see in the transgastric short axis view. And that's what our cardiologists really like to see all the time. And they help them better uh, orient. Something that's a bit tricky is, is uh, decide whether we can clip or we cannot clip. And we obviously always want to clip, so one way to clip is if the gap between the leaflet is more than one millimeter, which which is uh, which was uh, actually uh, it remains a contra relative contraindication for this procedure. But something that we can do is we can actually try and increase the peep, um, and then we look at the at the same picture. So this is to the left. You can see, or maybe you can convince yourself uh, that if you, with PEEP, they're, 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 the leaflet come a little bit close together. And, and this is something that usually we do when we grasp. So when we actually have the clip in position and we're ready to actually grasp the leaflet, we stop the ventilation, we just increase the PEEP to 30 sometimes even 40 if the patient can tolerate it and then we stop the the ventilation for the time it takes to grasp the leaflet sometimes through three minutes the patient can tolerate it if we've well if we've uh, if we've had them uh, well pre-oxygenated the other trick about this procedure is that this transgastric short axis view it's not always uh, in the same at the same angle and and sometimes it's very tricky to find and this is just an example where we were uh, completely lost because the, uh, actually it took us a while to figure out the anatomy for this patient. And on the right side, you can see this uh, view. We could only find it at 120 degrees. So my advice is don't have a fixed number in your head, but have sort of the anatomical correlation in your head. And that's what you need to know you want to. So here is, uh, going back to our case, we've deployed the second clip and we look and regurgitant jet, there's basically regurgitation. The only problem was that as we uh, look uh, uh, at these two clips, like the one clip, second clip was, in, uh, was good and stable, the first clip we found it was a, a little bit moving a little bit too much, but because we couldn't get a good cut through the second clip now, with multi views, we could actually get our cursor on the second, on the first clip, and as you can see, <coughs> this uh, first clip is uh, a little bit, maybe too mobile or a little bit mobile, but the leaflets are actually still going into the clip, so we were sort of satisfied and we decided not to do anything. A particular and a gradient. Also, sort of guide for success. Uh, gradient, obviously, uh, we wouldn't accept anything more than three millimeters of mercury mean gradient. Uh, uh, but for the tricuspid valve, uh, it's rarely, rarely a problem. So, as a technical vignette, and to conclude, um, uh, again, we know functional tricuspid regurgitation involves. Uh, uh, annular dilatation and leaflets, and there's been many percutaneous uh, approaches that's been proposed, and uh, starting from addressing the annulus, addressing the gap with the Forma device that we've have had some experience in Toronto before I moved here to Leipzig, and here 
with the clip we are only addressing really one problem in uh, within these uh, the tricuspid valve and um, and and so this is that we actually need to know um, and basically all of our clinical work is based on the largest trial that one of our cardiologists Philip Lurz was involved with uh, whose senior author is Rebecca Hahn, and uh, this was the Triluminate trial where 88 patients in a prospective multicenter single arm trial, patients with tricuspid regurgitation, there was at least moderate and a gap less than one millimeter were, uh, were actually treated. And as you, as you can see, although this is a little bit more, it's a, it's a little bit um, sort of uh, not so easy to read, but there was a good success in the great majority of cases. There was significant improvement of uh, uh, degree of tricuspid regurgitation and uh, uh, right ventricular uh, dimensions. And um, in terms of uh, um, clinical improvement, all of the patients had a significant improvement uh, uh, from as you can see, 75% at baseline had either a New York Heart Association class 3 or 4, and, and that, that actually decreased drastically at 30 days to 20%, and at 6 months to, to, 12, to, 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 to 13%, with a, a, a very low uh, complication rate, with 9% of the patient had uh, stracuspid stenosis, we unfortunately Fortunately, haven't had any so far, and uh, with detachment of the clip from one of the leaflet in seven percent of the cases, and this is something that unfortunately we've seen a few times, and we've basically just dealt with like sometimes placing a, an extra clip or just leave it alone. What is critical and what is important here, and what we've learned from this uh, from this study is that um, in order to have an improve in uh, uh, clinical outcome and uh, the way the patient feel, we don't necessarily need to resolve the tricuspid regurgitation. And that's why uh, this new classification of tricuspid regurgitation has been proposed by Rebecca Ann and Zamorano, where we have within severe, we have three different levels of, of severity, of how severe they are. So severe, massive, and torrential. Where actually, um, if we have an improvement from any of these uh, uh, points to the lowest one, so say from torrential to massive, or massive from severe, at the end of the procedure, the patient would still have severe tricuspid regurgitation, but they will actually definitely get a, a significant um, clinical benefit and they will eventually feel better. I remain available for any question per email. I thank you once again and I'm sorry I couldn't connect live and uh, it's a honor and uh, it's a, I'm extremely proud to see how some of my younger colleagues uh, have uh, been taking this conference to the next level and they are doing phenomenal, phenomenal job uh, at uh, Toronto General Hospital and uh, contributing to the world uh, of uh, perioperative transesophageal echocardiography. Thank you very much.